Steady on, Danny. Shadow Legends. Yeah, I'm probably going to include that. That was me testing my mic, and the first thing that came to my mind <laughs> while testing the mic is Shadow Legends. Raid Shadow Legends. And I mean, I guess that's because this video is the world's most shameless promotions, and it's brought to you by Rage. It's not. It's not. They keep emailing me, <laughs> so you've never seen my show. I know you haven't, because it's... Dear creator. <laughs> Dear Mr. Blaze. <laughs> would you like to be sponsored by Ray? I, I was on Twitter this morning and uh, on my, someone had tagged me on a thread with uh, Linus from Linus Tech Tips. Also, speaking of, that guy's got like 300,000 followers and he's not verified. So I, was, I immediately saw it and he was saying like how the, you guys don't like Raid Shadow Legends, huh? And I was like, oh, this is like a parody account because it's not verified. And then I click on it, see it's really him or at least an imposter with 300,000 followers. <laughs> and then I realized in his last video done a Raid Raid Shadow Legends ad and all of the comments are just like, that was a real Raid Shadow Legends ad? It wasn't a joke? I mean, Raid has taken it to another level, hasn't it? Because no one watches a Raid ad and is like, yeah, I'm gonna get Raid. It's just like, what is going on? Also, I'm, I'm still waiting for my checks because I talk enough about raids that I do feel like they should actually be paying me. The world's most shameless promotions. I will actually say that this video is brought to you by my new podcast, The Casual Criminalist. It's a true crime show. Why did I do that? Because, <laughs> Two things. One, whenever I do anything about murder or killers or anything horrible on YouTube, everyone's like, yeah, we'll watch that. So, Biographics, a channel I do where we cover people. It's like biographies, you know, obvious. <laughs> Anytime we do like murderer, whatever, it's like, oh, that'll get three times as many views. So I was like, look, I might not be a brilliant businessman, but I can see when there's an opportunity. Also, true crime is just, it's just popular and it's, uh, I, I enjoy it. So I made a podcast about it. It's also a YouTube channel. There are some links below. Click on them if you want. Do you fancy making shit loads of money very quickly without breaking any laws or investing much effort? Boy, do I, Danny. If the answer is no, it's not, Danny. Then you were clearly born in the wrong time in the wrong universe and there's the wrong species. What is with our species? And it's like, yeah, 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 I'd like to get rich, but I don't really want to do any work. <laughs> yeah, I know what it comes with, but it's not what I want. Or maybe this is just a secret test to ascertain your levels of devotion to communism and you've passed with flying colors, comrade. In which case, advance to go, how did you pass? I said no. I said yes, I would like to make shitloads of money with making no effort. Come on! And everyone's like, Simon, you make videos on the internet. You have this! And share it with everyone else in your neighborhood. Oh, God. There should be a communist version of Monopoly, where it's just like, yeah, you pass, go, collect $200, and then give it back to the state. If the answer is that yes, then here's a cunning, cunningly step, simple three-step plan, which is guaranteed to bring in bags of gold coins. Ooh, business plays get rich quick scheme react ready number one launch a new youtube channel <laughs> don't do that don't do that <laughs> most people don't make it work it can be about anything you want recipes unboxings reaction videos reaction to reaction videos that's a good one actually anything that tickles your <laughs> reacting to reaction video i've actually seen some of these if you're at a complete loss just pretend it's meant to be about business or something oh but a bomb bomb very clever danny patrick you're fired try and get a few subscribers yeah, just that's, you know, I feel like that's the question mark, question mark, question mark thing, you know, where it's like, have good idea, question, 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 profit, you know, the Reddit meme or whatever. Number three, sit back and wait for the inevitable email. Oh, by the way, I have a subreddit, reddit.com forward slash r forward slash Simon Whistler. There's like 1,000 people on there. It's embarrassing. Please. Take my Reddit numbers to less embarrassing levels. Overall, it's something like, what? six point something million YouTube subscribers and my subreddit has a thousand people. It's a little bit awkward. Number three, sit back and wait for the inevitable email from the marketing team at Raid Shadow Legends. Oh, two paragraphs in and we finally got there. Offering you a ton of money to sell your soul to the Dark Lord Siroth. I bet, I, I think Danny, he mentioned on Twitter that he actually played Raid Shadow Legends as in research for this script. So I guess Dark Lord Siroth is actually a thing. If anyone actually plays Raid, let me know and then go flog yourself and uninstall Raid. I was going to explain the plot and the gameplay of the premium mobile game Raid Shadow Legends and even had a few goes on it myself for research purposes. Big brain. But I was worried that I'd send Simon to sleep before he got even past the introduction of the video. I'm sure you've already got a rough idea of what it is anyway. It's a fantasy theme, turn-based, role-playing game. I, I honestly didn't. I didn't. Anytime I see a Raid Shadow ad, I'm like, skip mother <laughs> Forward 10 seconds, six times, and then if they're still going on, do it more. Do it more! Oh, I have to shout less. 
I, f I finished last week's Business Blaze recordings. I did three on one day because it was after the holidays and it destroyed me. And my voice was sore for the whole week. I still feel like my throat is a little bit swollen. It was really uncomfortable. Every time I was eating, I was like, oh, why do I shout so much? Uh, you drive through story-driven campaigns while engaging in dreary turn-based combat with other characters, picking up coins and gems and sh** and raising an army to ultimately defeat Dark Lord Siroth. There you go. You'd think that a game set in a fantasy world would be populated with mysterious creatures, and it should be quite enchanting and captivating for those who like that sort of thing. I I hate this. Anytime it's like there's dragons and shit, I'm fucking out. So I really wouldn't like it anyway. And uh, Danny also says, even if you like it, it's a bit shit. It's kind of like the smartphone equivalent of doing the dishes or taking out the garbage. Once you get past the fairly swishy graphics, you soon realize that the whole plot of the game is fantasy by numbers. There's not a single shred of real imagination or creativity to be found anywhere in the game. Oh, Danny, you're spilling the tea! Which is a phrase that I first heard well, a year ago when, when, you know, tea meaning like gossip. And I hated it. And I was like, oh, oh it sounds like, you know, what my grandma would use to describe gossip. And now I really like it. <laughs> and the gameplay is often just repetitive and monotonous to the point where playing it feels like a long-winded chore. It takes absolutely ages to achieve anything remotely useful or rewarding. If this video gets 10,000 likes, I will install Raid Shadow Legends and I don't know how to live stream. <laughs> but if I can figure it out, we'll live stream Raid. And I'll absolutely rip the shit out of it unless they pay me. That's not blackmail. <laughs> I realize that sounded really like I'm blackmailing them. I'm not. Just if they sponsor me, obviously I'll say nice things about them. But you know, always with a bit of this. Eh? Eh? Unless, of course, you speed things up a bit by getting out your wallet. And this, of course, is the real story behind Raid Shadow Legends. And it's so blatant that it's beggar's belief. Danny, we know this. <laughs> It's not about crafting a multi-layered storyline or creating an immersive gaming world. It's about testing your patience to the point where you surrender to the temptation of handing over your credit card details so that you can buy upgrade perks and progress through the game without spending months slogging it out on your phone screen to achieve something as simple as earning a nice little amulet. It's pretty much impossible to compete with other players or get anywhere in the game without forking out a lot of real money. This play-to-play -play thing, it, I feel like this is new. And then the other day I was thinking about there's a there's a game I fucking love. I, they had one at uh, university and I used to play it all the time. Spent way too much money on that motherfucker. Time Crisis 2 with the light gun. You got two screens side by side. You play with a friend. It's absolutely epic. I love the shit out of that game. Although I recently bought an Oculus Quest 2 and that's just a different level of games. I'm like, holy shit. It's like, I am inside a soldier's body. What was I talking about? Yeah, so Time Crisis 2. And it's like, yeah. You play the game. I, I mean, I could get pretty far in it off just one one payment because I spent so much money that I got good at it. But yeah, if you if you're absolutely shit at the game and you just keep putting in 50p, if you've got like 400 quid, you'll definitely get the high score because every time you die, or you have three lives, was it four lives? God, it's been a long time. You just keep putting in more 50p's and you'll eventually win and get the high score. And it's like, that's pay to play. Why are we talking about this? And fortunately, the game regularly reminds you about the benefits of paying for upgrades as you make your fantastical journey through the seven realms of Twatalon, <laughs> or whatever it's called. I can love it. And why are there always realms in fantasy? Like who has, you know, realms is, if someone said, you know, realms, I think of like medieval shit, where they probably didn't use the word realm or, or like Lord of the Rings or some boring shit like that. Smash that dislike button. In fact, half of the challenge is not so much battling against the dark forces of evil, but battling against the pop-up boxes which bombard you at every turn. During my first attempt to play in the game, I found myself having to close down a sequence of eight boxes, pushing me to spend real money before I could figure out what I was meant to be doing. And many of them are accompanied by a frantic countdown timer and a bid to persuade you to get your wallet out before you've had a chance to get your brain in gear and realize what you're doing with your life. I've just realized that a thousand likes is way too little on a business plays video. It needs 5,000. 5,000 likes! And I will live play. I probably won't live stream it because it's really, everyone's like, Simon, why don't you live stream? Why don't you live stream? And I'm like, generally, I find live streams a bit boring. Like, when it's edited, it's like all of the thinking time and sipping coffee and, you know, being like, oh, I need to have a fart. I cut all that shit out and it's much more punchy. And I find that more exciting. <laughs> But uh, look, if, it, if you overwhelm me in the comments with like, I'll do a poll, I'll do a poll, live stream or edit, easy. But only if this gets 5,000 likes. 
only if you subscribe to my new podcast, The Casual Criminalist. Many of these boxes are accompanied by a frantic countdown timer and a bid to persuade you to get your wallet out before you figure out how much you're willing to spend so it can squeeze more money out of the players who seem quite happy to dig into their pockets to pay for useless, meaningless crap. Uh, and all of this isn't that life, though. <laughs> Where we just spend our time buying useless, meaningless crap. It's kind of, kind of it, isn't it? Perch the merch .co. Get yourself. Why am I wearing a t-shirt? Why am I wearing merch? Why am I wearing my own merch? What the fuck, Whistler? Well, you can purchase this mug. See, it says Blaze, Biz Blaze, but like another logo you might be familiar with. All of this makes the relentless marketing campaign for Raid Shadow Legends seem so utterly shameless. Ever since the title was first launched in 2018, the Israeli developers Plarium Games, more like Plagium, given how much I have to put up with your shit, have gone to town with blanket generic marketing draped over every corner of cyberspace. The animated video advertisements are about as creative as the game. They usually involve an overdramatic voice chanting out the same key phrases like a misleading mantra of deception. The short list of repetitive phrases includes Forget everything you know about mobile games. Totally free to play. Awesome graphics. Amazing storyline. Koi reminds me of my podcast, The Casual Criminalist, which you should check out. There's a link below. Now I'll concede that the graphics look quite good to me, but I'm possibly the wrong person to judge. I still think that the graphics in Space Invaders are chillingly realistic. And I suspect it's probably a good idea to try and forget everything you know about mobile games, as you're more likely to be impressed with what's on offer if your memory has been completely wiped of all the other more entertaining games which you could be playing on your phone. Yeah, uh, it, can't be, it can't be misleading advertising, because that's technically true. <laughs> Allegedly. Oh, all of this is alleged, by the way. Allegedly, Raid is all of these things. And definitely, this is all my own opinion. And definitely not fact. Definitely not fact. But the slogans relating to free gameplay and amazing storyline are quite laughable. Allegedly. <laughs> Jesus, Danny. Allegedly. <laughs> the title, in my opinion. The title may be free to install, but it's going to cost you a packet to get anywhere in this hollow realm of mundaneity. Over the last couple of years, Playerium Games have faced a foe even mightier than the Dark Lord Siroth. His name is Adblocker, and companies crumble with his iron fist. And so does Simon. <laughs> Any time, like, when people, like, I, I literally posted on this morning, someone left a comment being like, 10 ads on a video, Simon, 10 ads? And I just replied, <laughs> only because I couldn't fit in 11. And it's like, people, people will be like, I'm going to install an ad block. I'm like, fucking you do you, man. You do you. <laughs> I don't care. Like, there's enough people who are not dickheads. <laughs> But they've got to get, a, but they've got around this problem by getting YouTubers to promote their game within the content of their videos. You'll never capture me, right? You'll never capture me! I wasn't going to shout as much. My throat hurts. Over the last couple, of, oh god! A recent tweet from this company appeared to deny that this was the case, stating that we do not sponsor. We cooperate only with those YouTubers who play our game and want to be our influencers. We do not pay money for it, bro. I'm sorry, but allegedly that is a. Lie. Why the fuck you lying? Why you always lying? And I know it's a lie because I've negotiated with you. It took a whole six days of online roasting before the company later clarified its position in a purposefully confusing follow up tweet which declared that they were just talking about the fan engagement rather than the paid marketing side of the operation, which is completely different. You sketchy motherfuckers, allegedly. <laughs> And this was complete bollocks, as the original tweet had been a direct response to an inquiry about paid marketing. I'm sure we're all aware now that Playerium Games aren't particularly fussy about who they pest to promote their game or a YouTube video. Yeah, they will literally ask, ask anyone, even if you've been constantly slanging off their game in your videos for months. And I honestly think that Simon should give it a go and donate the fee to charity. <laughs> Steady on, Danny. He could deliver the most sarcastic and piss-taking ad read to ever grace the uh, YouTube, and nobody at Playerium Games would bat an eyelid, as long as Simon mentions the awesome graphics and amazing storyline. Despite all of this, Playerium Games must be doing something right, as they continue to throw big bucks at YouTube as to promote a game which has already been downloaded 250 million times, son. Shit! <laughs> And although nobody outside of Plarium knows the exact figure, it's estimated that the game currently rakes in about a hundred grand a day. I have to say that seems quite low. 
I know that's a lot of money, but considering how much they pay ad for advertising, that is not that much. It's it's more. It's it's more. But even the name of the game is just a cold heart of calculation. Long-term players have no idea why the game is called Raid Shadow Legends, bearing in mind that the storyline has not made any reference to either a raid, shadows, or legends. They're just three strong words which have been bolted onto the game in order to get more exposure in search results. Oh, this is so shady. Ah, oh, the sequel will probably be Ultimate Super Zero Zombies Magic Quest War on Chronicles Unleashed. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I feel like that someone has emailed me with this in there, like, Hey, we're a Hello Influencer. We represent the company Plague, Plagium Games, and we've got a game called Super Zero Zombies. I would 100% believe that. Uh, oh, that was the introduction. Hello everyone, welcome to Business Space. <laughs> Longest introductions in the game. Greasy Triple Whopper. Over the last trip couple of decades, Burger King has launched a, lo a list of questionable promotions which could be considered genius, sexist, pornographic, holy sh**. Intrusive, degrading, ethically wrong, illegal, and definitely shameless. Oh sh**. I remember Burger King, they were the ones who like, you could unfriend five of your friends on Facebook and get a whopper. I mean like, fucking game on, son. <laughs> that is worth it, because I don't value friendships. But for now, I wanted to concentrate on three campaigns in particular, which took a digital swipe at Facebook, Google, Home Hub, and Twitch. The first is the Whopper Sacrifice, that's what I was talking about, from 2009, in which customers were invited to shed their Facebook friendships in exchange for a free Whopper. The marketing material encouraged users to install Whopper Sacrifice on your Facebook profile and will reward you with a free flame broiled Whopper when you sacrifice 10 of your friends. I didn't know what broiling was for the longest time. I think we call it grilling in the UK, like where you put something under the grill, like in the, you got the oven, I know in the top part of the oven you have a broiler, we call that a grill, and it grills it. Fascinating. So the idea is, or maybe I just missed that. British people, let me know below. So the idea is that you install the new Burger King app. Danny, I know this, I feel like we've covered this before. It's very repetitive and boring. No wonder no one likes business plays. The, so the idea is that you install the new Burger King, it's nothing to do with me being a dickhead. Uh, and un for unfriend un 10 of your Facebook buddies, oh it's 10, still f***ing worth it. And they receive a notification message that you terminated your friendship in exchange for one tenth of a three dollar whopper. It obviously works for Burger King as each of your ten victims receive a promotional message which encourages them to do exactly the same thing. It's a bit like a weird whopper shaped pyramid scheme in which only Burger King gets rich but everybody else at least get a free whopper as a reward for admitting that they value a free whopper more, than, more highly than ten friendships. But Facebook is the big loser here because that's going to go viral around Facebook and everyone's unfriending each other and that's not good for Facebook. They like it when you got friends and connections and all of that because like can you imagine you're just hanging out and someone on frenzy and it's like oh yeah that's that's not good i'm gonna close my facebook account and kill myself <laughs> this got dark really quick let's move on it obviously works for burger king as <laughs> do i need to do a trigger warning one time i did this like i, I was like <laughs> and someone was like that reminds me of suicide you could have included a trigger warning and i'm like but no <laughs> what's going on how do you survive in the world <laughs> I saw a car today. Reminded me of car accidents. Cars need to have trigger war. What the f is going on? I saw a stack of papers today. Reminded me of paper cuts. <laughs> there were a few obvious loopholes. You could just add your Facebook friends back onto your list the next day after you receive your free coupon, assuming you had to piss them off too much. In fact, you didn't have to unfriend them at all. It's possible for a third-party app to access Facebook's unfriend option. All the Burger King could do was to encourage you to send uh, each of the 10 message notifications that would technically earn you the coupon and then guide you through the unfriend option afterwards. But it was up to you whether you went ahead and pressed the button or not. Oh, okay. Although some critics felt the campaign was obnoxious and puerile, it was wildly successful for a few days at least, and 20,000 coupons were distributed following the termination of 200,000 Facebook friendships. Good! However, it took less than a week for Facebook. I don't have Facebook anymore and I'm f***ing happier for it. I have like a work one that I have to have for work because I have a profile and show. I need to keep an eye on things, make sure I'm not getting terribly slammed online. Don't need any more lawsuits. And I, I, I don't miss it. I don't miss it. I don't need to know what, what Peter, who I went to school when I was 12 with, is getting up to. I don't care. However, it took less than a week for Facebook to ban the app on the grounds that it was a violation of user privacy. The main issue seemed to be that Facebook users aren't supposed to know when another user has unfriended them. They can easily find out when they look through their friend list and they're like, where's Peter? 
Twice Peter! And it was certainly a campaign designed to needlessly ruffle a few feathers just for the sake of a free burger. A few years later, Burger King decided to take over the technology on living room without your permission. I've noticed that whenever Simon asks Siri a video and a question the question in a video, we usually see a few comments from viewers pointing out that their own Siri kicked on upon Simon's activation. And Burger King, what could I do right now? Hey Siri, maximum volume. And Burger King took the idea to a new extreme in 2017 when they targeted uh, Google Home Hub users in a series of TV commercials. At the very end of the commercial, a guy in a Burger King uniform leans forward into the screen and yells, OK Google, what is the Whopper Burger? At this point, everyone watching the ad in the room with a nearby Google Home Hub would suddenly hear their speakers crackle into life as Google ran through Wikipedia's entry for a Whopper Burger. And for an extra dollop of craftiness, Burger King had recently updated the Wikipedia entry themselves to make the details seem even more appealing and juicy than usual. That sounds like a violation of Wikipedia's terms of service. I don't suppose they were breaking any laws by switching on your Google Home Hub without permission, and in fact the brief campaign- <laughs> that's good to know. And in fact the brief campaign went on to win a few major marketing awards before Google blocked the strategy by disabling the search option for Whopper Burgers on the Home Hub. Full marks though, for, internet tr for the internet trolls who took the opportunity to tweak the Wikipedia entry again while the ad campaign was still in full swing so that viewers at home ended up receiving a lecture from their Google Home Hub on that Whopper, on how Whopper burgers gave you cancer. Mwah! But perhaps Burger King's most shocking violation, <coughs> see, came in 2020 when they hijacked the live streaming service Twitch. I'll be honest, I don't have any experience with Twitch, me neither Danny, as I don't generally have much interest in watching video game live streaming, me neither Danny. But, although I do watch video game YouTube channels sometimes, so maybe I do, but apparently it's quite common for viewers to show their appreciation and support for the stream they're enjoying by making a live donation. Using a feature developed by Streamlabs, viewers can give a minimum donation of $1 along with a little fan message. And in return, the message will appear live on screen during the stream and will be read out in a robotic voice by a text-to-speech plugin. Is that real? That's kind of, kind of like, I can see where the opportunity for abuse is here. <laughs> if you're very lucky, the streamer might even respond to the message and give you a shout out. There was certainly plenty to shout out about when Burger King gate crashed the party and seized the tool for their own promotional purposes. Suddenly, small $5 donations came flooding in to the most popular Twitch streams, prompting the automatic broadcast of messages such as, I have donated five bucks, so I can say that on the Burger King ad, you can get a Whopper, small French fries, and a small drink for five dollars. Is that a particularly good deal? Isn't there a dollar menu where you get like one item, so you get, that would be like three bucks? And it's all small, why not just say french fries and a drink? You don't have to say this, but you have to say they're small, is that the law? Now this is pretty poor form as many of the Twitch channels rely on big sponsorship deals from big companies in order to survive and the sponsorship is always clearly flagged as a paid promotion. This is all correct. However, I mean, it's also fair game. I feel like this is fair game. And I mean, if, if you've, some of you have almost certainly seen Raid Shadow Legends adverts on this video. Like, you know, where there's a mid-roll or at the beginning or at the end, you see like Raid Shadow Legends. But it's also totally fair. I get 45% of the money they paid to, for, to put that ad there. Woo! 55%. Yeah, I get 55%. YouTube keeps 45, which is very generous of them. Thank you, business daddy. Mwah. Love you. Burger King appeared to be getting through the back door here by paying peanuts for guerrilla marketing on a popular channel without having to make any agreements with the streamer or provide a fair and sensible financial reward. Except the streamer allowed for this by installing the Streamlabs lab, app. And I mean, if you're not happy with that, then don't do it. It would be like, I, 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 this is, Burger King are just playing the game, guys. And just to rub more ketchup and pickles into the wounds, but a the advertising agency behind the stunts, David Madrid, that's the name of the advertising agency, <laughs> later boasted about the stunts on Twitter, posting some of the infuriated reactions from the streamers after seeing the unauthorized adverts pop up while they were busy trying to play 3D dwarf tossing or whatever they do in front of a devoted audience. <laughs> the campaign only lasted for a few hours, and it's debatable whether any action will be taken or if any laws were broken. Streamlabs claimed that the stunt broke their terms of service, which prohibits using their software for commercial purposes. Well, there you go. I mean, it's our law, but it is a violation the TOS so they could ban you, I guess, but you're already done. It's guerrilla marketing. Some people argue that the FTC team needs to investigate the matter, because, it, but it's a very murky area as most of the rules and codes relate to how streamers should go about endorsing products and services in a stream, and they had no control over what was happening in this case. Yeah, it's definitely not the streamer's fault. I mean, this happens, I understand, but I mean, they're not responsible for the content in that case. I personally don't believe, I don't know what the law says there. And I also don't think Burger King are violating any FTC law, are they? I mean, maybe they should have disclosed, but do they have to? 
in that situation. I don't know. I'm not a lawyer. Let's not go there. This isn't the channel where we solve complex legal issues. If Burger King have broken any laws here, it may turn out to be a rare case of broadcast signal intrusion. The hijacking of broadcast signals of radio, television stations, cable, television broadcast feeds, or satellite signals, but it remains to be seen whether any action will be taken over this case of casual criminality. And speaking of casual criminality, um, I've got a new podcast called The Casual Criminalist. You see how I'm shamelessly plugging this throughout this episode in a very meta episode, I guess? Uh, I hope you're loving it as much as you love Raid. Shadow Legends, not the stuff that's used to kill spiders. Product placement hell. Perhaps the most shameless form of marketing of all is the product placement strategy. Uh... <laughs> Butchthemerch.co! I was reflecting on this this morning as I slapped a few drops of Beard Blaze oil onto my face. Mmm. And if you'd like to get Beard Blaze beard, beard oil, a product from me, it's not a sponsorship, it's actually mine. You can go to beardblaze.com and hook yourself up. I usually go for the Blazing Outdoors range as it reminds me a bit of what the outside world smells like. I haven't even got a beard. Ah, yes. Well, I mean, maybe you can use it like as, as an essential oil. You put it under, you know, one of those weird ceramic things with a little candle in and you drop some oils in the top. I wonder if you could do that. I'm gonna try and do that. Maybe I'll do that. It would open up Beard Blaze all to a whole new market. Hippies. And they already have beards! The idea of shoving products in your face while you're innocently enjoying a film is more than a little devious, but it's a lucrative business. The product placement industry as a whole is worth over $10 billion, and the product placement in movies accounts for nearly 20% of that figure. Yeah, I mean, I get it, because it totally works. Like, after seeing Scarface, I got super into cocaine. The product placement was amazing. I've never seen Scarface. Is that does I've seen the meme though where there's the pile of cocaine. Is that that Scarface? It usually doesn't detract too much from the film, and the, but the subliminal advertising messages can leave a sour taste in the popcorn buckets. But boom, boom, when film studios get a bit carried away with the idea. Back to the Future Part Two managed to slyly promote Nike and Pepsi without getting in the way of the plot too much. Yeah, I mean those Nike uh, automatic lace-up shoes. That's pretty cool. And when he goes in, he's like, "What a Pepsi! I want a Pepsi!" It was great. I fucking love that. The 1998 romantic comedy. You've Got Mail goes much further by basing the whole movie around the AOL's trademarked, and trademarked, trademarked notification sounds while Tom Hanks was at it again just a couple of years later in Castaway, which so which was positively smothered in FedEx packaging, although FedEx claimed that they didn't pay a single cent for the product placement. It made FedEx look really good though, so. Although I love FedEx. Like pretty much whenever, whenever a company wants to send me shit, I'm like, you've got two choices, FedEx or UPS, FedEx preferred. I love FedEx. It's insane. Like one time, I, there's an advertising agency we work with in Chicago, and they had to send me something like super urgent. And they're like, yeah, 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 we just FedExed it. And it arrived the next day to me in Prague, in Europe. And I'm like, this is insane. And then I found out how much it cost. And I was like, Gabe, are you coming along with the package? Because that's like the price of a flight. <laughs> but FedEx get their shit. The 1993 Sylvester Stallone sci-fi movie Demolition Man is set in a post-apocalyptic future, long after the franchise wars, which left only one restaurant chain still standing. Taco Bell. <laughs> Curious, I love that movie. <laughs> and I love the three seashells. Curious, it did. Uh, by the way, at some point during this video, I, I cut it and I went to use the three seashells and then I came back. TMI! You don't even know where. It was during the Burger King bit. Could you see how it's some, after, after that it was just more relieved? Just like, oh, yeah. It was an odd choice for a sponsor, as Taco Bell weren't even widely known outside the US back then, and so loads of scenes had to be redubbed or even specially reshot for the overseas market, where the last remaining restaurant chain was transformed from Taco Bell into Pizza Hut, both of which were co-owned by Pepsi at the time. Hang on, I remember it being Taco Bell, though. And I'm in, I grew up in the UK, we didn't have Taco Bell, we had Pizza Hut. Shit, was it Pizza Hut? I definitely, before Danny mentioned it, I remember it's got to do with Taco Bell, but that might just be because of the memes. It seems like a lot of pissing about for a product placement, or bearing in mind that Demolition Mission Man also predicted that everyone would still be using Sony mini discs in the year 2032. It's possible they picked the wrong horses for the franchise wars. It's also worth mentioning the moment that the James Bond movies jumped the shark. For the record, that was in the 2012 film Skyfall. I don't know, man. Like, James Bond? I'd love an Aston Martin just because, like, James Bond makes him look cool. It's like, yeah. It's also worth, uh, the Bond movies have been no strangers to product placement in the past, with 007 happily promoting Aston Martins and Rolexes, also like those, over as many different incarnations. But one thing was set in stone. Bond's favorite tipple was always a Vespa Martini shaken, not stirred. Oh yeah, and then he drinks Heineken. It's like, James, no! Heineken, why? It is shit. Oh good, then it's not just me. 
Uh, that is until a new sponsorship deal in 2012 saw Daniel Craig ditching the traditional Vespa Martini and downing bottles of dirty, bloody Heineken instead. I mean, it is a little bit different. I mean, Vespa Martini sounds ultra classy. Whereas, yeah, the Heineken. Ah, oh, you are a normal average person. You'd have never caught Sean Connery lowering his standards like that in a million years. Daniel Craig, not my bond. However, the most shameless offenders of all came, both came in the right, right at the end of the 1980s. The Wizard movie I've never heard of, uh, was a 1989 film from Universal, which was essentially just a 100-minute commercial for Nintendo. The Japanese gaming company was already flying high that year and arguably didn't need any promotion at all. But a bottleneck in the memory chip supply chain had resulted in delays for the North American market, who were still excitedly awaiting the release of the much-anticipated Super Mario Bros. 3 for the NES. The Wizard was marketed as a wholesome family film following the story of a trio of young troubled kids who run away from home to take part in a Nintendo video game championship called Video Armageddon. In a bid to win a grand prize of $50,000, it starred Fred Savage, still at the height of fame from the TV show The Wonder Years, alongside early appearances by Christian Slater and a very young Tobey Maguire. Who's Fred Savage? I know Christian Slater and Tobey Maguire, of course. But in fact, the, uh, maybe I, I'm sure if I saw a picture of him, I'd be like, oh yeah, this guy. But the whole, but in fact, the whole venture was little more than a product placement party for Nintendo, who had final script approval on the film. The climax of the story is pretty much an official preview of Super Mario Bros. 3 for North, 3 for North America, as the kids play the new game in their battle for the ultimate prize. Spoiler alert, the most troubled kid wins the tournament and everyone goes home to live happily ever after. What a surprise. In real life, the most talented person wins. The cheesiest and most memorable moment in The Wizard comes with the subtle as a sledgehammer promotion for Nintendo's new power glove. Whoa! A glove controller. <laughs> that took off. Uh, which was a bit like an early version of the Wiimote. God, I f***ing hate that name. Let's just refer to it as the Wii Remote, can we? Also, why did we name a games console Wii? I know I'm about 15 years to 20 years. How old is that? I don't even know. I'm late on this joke, but what the f***? Although nowhere near as effective, during a pivotal scene, one of the protagonists slips on the gloves and dramatically delivers a legendary line with pure hammy relish. I love the power glove. It's so bad. That's very... 80s, isn't it? 80s? He was right. It was bloody awful. Only two games were ever released to make specific use of this fiddly and imprecise power glove, which was destined to go down in history as one of the worst controllers ever produced. Still, the film probably played a small role in helping Super Mario Bros. 3 to become the third best-selling game of all time for the NES, shifting an impressive 17 million units worldwide. However, even this dramatic Nintendo game launch can walk away with slightly more pride than a certain other wholesome family film released just a year earlier in 1988. I can remember getting dragged to the cinema to watch Mac and Me for a schoolmate's birthday. I hadn't heard much about the film beforehand, but it was sold to me on the idea that it's the new E.T. This is the one that was super promoting McDonald's, right? Where they had like a... There was some sort of dancing going on in a McDonald's for no reason whatsoever. It ended up being one of the most woeful experiences I've ever had in a cinema. Even worse than that time that the cinema caught far halfway through Ghostbusters and we had to be evacuated. Fuck it out, Danny. It would be very generous to describe the film as the new E.T. Mac and Me was actually a blatant ripoff of E.T., but with any trace of magic or charm replaced by soulless promotions for McDonald's. The plot centers around a little wheelchair-using boy called Eric, who befriends a crap alien creature called Mac, who longs to be reunited with his alien family. How heartwarming. Along the way, Mac keeps saving Eric from perilous and yet strangely comical situations, such as when Eric loses control of his wheelchair and ends up sliding down a hill and straight into a lake. Isn't that the clip that some famous actor goes on some famous talk show? And every time, he's given them the wrong clip. I mean, I know it's all set up and it's fake, but it's like every time, it's just like, yeah, and let's watch a clip from your new movie, John. And then they roll the clip and it's the same scene and he's done it like over 20 years or something. It's very funny, but very staged because it's not like the Lena host is seeing this for the first time and doesn't expect it at all. It's like, oh, oh my God, you got me. It's like, no, you, you rehearsed this. Oh, television's so fake, everything's so fake. Even business plays is, is fake. I, this is actually fully scripted. All of these ramblings, I think about for days. Apparently, Mac's name is an acronym for Mysterious Alien Creature. Genius. Although everyone at school had assumed after watching the movie, <laughs> it's a massive alien cock. Uh, <laughs> if you want to see that on a t-shirt, I'd love to get a t-shirt that says massive alien cock. It may just be a coincidence that it sounds quite similar to a signature dish at McDonald's and the name of Mac's homeworld was revealed on screen, screen as Quartus Ponders. Who gives a fuck? 
It's hot. Oh, quarter pounders. Oh my God, genius. Oh, and Marcus McDonald's. Oh, oh. I'm so far dim sometimes. Oh my God. I wonder how I survive. Danny, how long is this? It's so long. Ha! <laughs> Gay! Oh, are we on the last page? Oh, there's two more pages. We're almost there, guys. My legs are tired. It's harder to forgive the five-minute dance sequence which takes place in McDonald's restaurants and features a guest star appearance by Ronald McDonald himself, that creepy f allegedly. The mad thing about this sequence, the only mascot creepier than Ronald McDonald's is Jared from Subway. The mad thing about this sequence is that the film and the narrative literally just stop for five senseless minutes while everyone decides to have a dance with Ronald against the happy backdrop of McDonald's menus. Now, it should be stressed that McDonald's has always denied ever paying a cent. Guys, come on! I mean, like, raids. No, we never paid anyone. McDonald's, no, we never paid anyone. FedEx, we never paid anyone. Guys, it's okay. It's okay. I mean, I don't know if you did, and I don't want to be, like, alleging anything. But in my opinion, it seems highly likely that allegedly you did, didn't you? You did. Uh, instead, they claim that they reached a deal with a film studio which granted rare permission to use McDonald's branding and characters. Why would you not grant that? I mean, if the movie's not gonna be like absolutely shitting on you. I'd be like, yeah, okay, you can use Business Blaze. I mean, no one ever would, but feel free. Don't, that's not, don't, don't. I'm just gonna back that, I'm gonna backtrack on that and be like, you need to consult me first. <laughs> but it's worth noting that the pro producer of the film, RJ Lewis, had previously worked in advertising campaigns for McDonald's, Christ. More specific, more significantly, the film was given a big chunk of funding from a food service distributor called Golden State Foods, who provided meat, ketchup, lettuce, and sauces for their store clients, who just happened to be McDonald's. I mean, it's the same company, right? In fairness, the product, product placement wasn't exclusively connected to McDonald's. The movie also managed to squeeze in promotion for Coca-Cola, Sears, Power Wheels, and Skittles within its 90-minute running time. Was there any of this movie that was actually plot or was it just all advertisements but none of this did much to preserve the film's legacy mac and me currently holds a zero percent critics rating on rotten tomatoes love it and is widely considered to be one of the worst crimes ever committed on the silver screen filmmaker morgan spurlock once declared it to be the worst thing you'll ever see on your entire life while the washington post suggested et should upgrade his catch race from et phone home to et call lawyer hilarious but a bump bump for the washington post i feel the film rather optimistically closes with the caption we'll be back over 30 years later nobody is waiting for the sequel maybe next time the producers should collaborate with burger king instead eric could team up with a new crap alien called a whopper who only agrees to become good buddies after eric shoots 10 of his old schoolmates deads and bombs the local broadcasting station to bits holy sh that got extreme this has been an episode of business blaze i have been your boy with the blaze if you'd like to purchase some merchandise that i am not working i don't wearing i don't know why perch the merch.co there's a whole range of fun t-shirts and this mug there are many of these in fact there's an infinite number because they're all print on demand it's not like i've got a giant stock of mugs that i need to ship check out my new podcast the casual criminalist and uh, i'll see you next time